I'd like to introduce, and I'm very happy, um, Dhanavir Gaswami, who is founder and president of Rupanuka College, um, Maharishi Das, which one? Yes, yes, there, you gotta hold your hand up, okay. And Yamuna Charya Das, okay. And they're gonna give us a little presentation on the Hare Krishnas. It's your floor, and this microphone works, as you can tell. <laughs> So, it's time. Okay. <clears throat> I think I've known Danavir for 10 years now. Do you think it's 10 years? I'm not sure. My voice is a little soft, so thank you for allowing us to come. Uh, we'd like to begin with a little chanting. Uh, you may have seen or heard us chanting before, so we'd like to do that. Um, we're going to chant this mantra. You may have heard the term mantra mantra man means mind and tra means to deliver so it delivers the mind from the material realm to the spiritual realm the names we only have three words but they're organized in this fashion this is called the maha mantra or great chant for deliverance. Hare refers to the energy of the Supreme. Krishna is a name for the Supreme Personality of Godhead Himself and Rama also. Krishna means all attractive and Rama is also a name for the Supreme Personality of Godhead, it means the reservoir of pleasure. So we chant this and uh, I We'll come up and I have my cartels in the back there. That the last one. Yeah. And uh, one one person sings first and then the others respond. They're in a they're in a bag, yeah. We'll bring it there you go. Okay. After we chant for a few minutes, I will address some of your questions, which I very much appreciate. These are very thoughtful. I'll only be able to probably address one from each. Oh, it doesn't uh, matter. You can do whatever you want. Yeah, I chose one of each, so representative. Okay. So uh, I'll play this. Well. I may, we may switch halfway through. This is called a murdanga, traditionally made of clay in India. But clay, thin clay, it breaks. So we used to bring them over from India, and by the time they got here, a lot of times they were already broken. So we decided to make them out of fiberglass. Same sound. or the clay models, you'll recognize the same sound. These are called cartels, made of brass and other metals combined. Okay, so I'll, first we'll sing a few uh, invocation mantras or chants to the spiritual master. Then we'll sing Hare Krishna and 
on the response. If you like, you can also sing along.
So uh, Maharshi is going to send around the, our cards. You can each take one if you like, pass them on. So I looked at your questions. They're very nice questions. They, they, like to dis they like to talk to you too. So usually what we do is we have someone lecture to us and then they, they like to ask questions too. So you can do that too. Yeah. Well, the questions are so good that um, by answering the questions, we should be able to cover pretty much okay. what I would have said in a more direct way. And then we'll leave some time for yes. further questions. Okay. All right. All right. What, 15 minutes? 15 yeah. Minutes? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Goes till 315. Um, yeah, goes to 315. Okay. So, first question must one be formally initiated into the faith to take part regularly in ceremonies. Certain ceremonies, yes, uh, like in the temples that we have, then it requires one to be initiated as a brahmana. 
Brahmana. Let's go. How far does it go? It can go. It can go. Here, maybe. The word Brahmana refers to the, you probably heard that word, refers to the uh, priestly order or teachers. It's by qualification, not by birth. That's a misconception that is, exists sometimes. People think that the four divisions or the castes are determined by one's birth, but actually according to Gita, it is determined by one's quality and work. Chatur varnyam maya shrishtam guna karma vibhagasa tasikartam apimam vidyakartam aviyam. Sanskrit language, known as the mother language. Mother meaning the oldest known language. So for certain ceremonies, yes, Brahmana uh, initiation is required. For others, like we are just doing chanting or coming to the temple or other activities, then no, it's not required that one be initiated to participate in those ceremonies. In fact, the public is also welcome to participate in the ceremonies, although they may not conduct them, but they can certainly participate. Next question. In reincarnation, do the Hare Krishnas believe that souls travel in clusters or individually? Individually. Because each individual person or soul is the architect of his own destiny. And he, he or she decides their future by their activities, karma. The word karma means, you've all heard that word, Karma. Karma means action. But in Sanskrit, it also means in action and reaction. Of course, that's implied in, because for every action there's a reaction, but sometimes it's overlooked, the reactions to our actions. And according to the Vedas, you've heard of the Vedas. Uh, okay. Veda. Veda means knowledge, and Vedas are the body of knowledge given in the uh, scriptures, such as Bhagavad Gita and other uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, the Puranas, the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, like that. These are all called the Vedas, Upanishads, taken together. So in the Vedas, it describes that the actions that one performs in this life produce the next life, the next. And we can even see that, we can talk for a few minutes on that because it's an important philosophical point, that the individual soul, or Atma, Atma refers, the word Atma refers to the self, and that self is precisely defined as being the soul, but it sometimes also refers to the mind, the body, and the intelligence. So the particular self or soul is eternal. He's never born and he never dies. But he transmigrates through different types of bodies. And the body that he's in, of course, goes through different changes. We know our body has gone through changes, don't we? When we were conceived, and this is an interesting um, uh, little journey here, maybe you can consider this. When we were conceived by our mother and father, what was the type of body we had? Like a little pea. Hmm? 
the first night of conception, little pea size. We were in there. We were inside that little pea body, pea body. And, but then, because, of course, you say, well, uh, that means we're very small. Yes. Keshagra shatabhagasya shatada kalpitasya cha. The Vedas say the soul is one ten thousandth the size of the tip of the hair. So small that it can enter even within the small pea, or even within the male semina, which it does. So, after the atma is in, put into that little pea body in the mother's womb, it begins to grow. There's a process, nourishment, she, uh, the soul is getting uh, some kind of nourishment from within the mother's womb. Then the body grows after a few weeks, begins to get a little bigger. Uh, and if you look at illustrations or they've taken photographs, scans of the, what the little uh, embryo looks like, it's very comparable to different types of animals. You can't, they're indistinguishable actually at different stages. I've actually compared them. You can't tell, for example, at a certain point, which is the human embryo and which is the horse embryo, which is the frog embryo, which is the tadpole, they look monkey, they look indistinguishable. So in a sense, thank you, we have, in this life, we've already transmigrated through different types of bodies, because the body is always changing. The material elements of the body are always changing. Some cells are dying, new cells are being born. Modern science says that every seven years, all the cells of the body are completely exchanged. So we have a new body every seven years. If you're 21 years old, you've already completely reincarnated three times in this lifetime. So we don't have to wait till the final junction of leaving this body at death we can already experience reincarnation in our own life every day, or if you wish, at least every seven years, we can go through a complete reincarnation. Okay, go on to the next question. How do you stop the cycle of mortal life? What, and this is a quote, she, uh, this person is quoting from the, uh, our website, I suppose, which says, what we do in this life sets us on our way to the next, just as what we do in school gets us ready for where we go when our schooling is over. In our next life, we can go up or we can go down, or we can get free from the cycle altogether. Oh, that's from a different website. Okay. Uh, yes, so... As we were mentioning about karma, according to our activities in this life, that will create a certain type of consciousness. Consciousness is subtle. Consciousness is a function of the soul. Every soul has consciousness, but we don't say that the person is consciousness, we say he has consciousness. So that consciousness subtle awareness, subtle um, conceptions, this is what carries the soul to his next status in life. Uh, we can all understand this. It's like if we want to, let's say we have a desire to build a big building. So that's the initial seed, the conception. Then we get some idea of what it will look like, maybe in our mind. Then we bring in an architect and we ask him to make a drawing. Then an engineer makes more detailed plans, then bring in the construction crew, etc., set the foundation. But all that began with the very subtle desire and vision in the mind. So consciousness is the beginning of the whole material realm and it determines our bodies. So, if one, for example, in this life, develops a certain consciousness, then after giving up this body, 
he will, his consciousness will take him to the next body. Let's say he develops a, a consciousness like a dog. There are some people you may know that have a consciousness similar to a dog's. So in the next life, they can get the body of a dog, because that's the consciousness that they developed. Some may develop a godly consciousness, a very divine consciousness, so that in their next life they go up to a higher realm. And uh, so, uh, the next perfect. The next one asks, what is Krishna consciousness? Okay. Um, so Krishna consciousness means when one is always thinking about Krishna. Uh, Krishna is a person. Maybe we can, uh, I can show this. It's a small picture, but uh, you can hold up this. Or you can even pass it around. Krishna, Reservoir of Pleasure, just hold that up first. This is a picture of Krishna, a small picture. Most attractive person. Krishna means all attractive. So, thank you. Um, to be conscious of Krishna means to be, just like if you're conscious of your lover. Say you have a lover. How are you conscious of your lover? What is one way you're conscious of them? Anyone have an idea? You can't stop thinking about Ah, yes. Uh, very, uh, nice explanation. Can't stop thinking about my lover. Even when I'm in school and the teacher is trying to give me some lessons, I can't stop thinking about my lover. And whatever the teacher says just goes right on by. Right, and they start text messaging while they're in class. Ah, this, <laughs> yes, this is the idea of when one is conscious of a lover. So it's the same idea in Krishna consciousness. One always thinks about Krishna. Manmana bhavamad bhakto madjaji mam namaskaru mame vaishasi satyam te pratijane priyosimi Krishna says always think of me, become my devotee, worship me, offer your homage unto me, thus you will come to me without fail. So this is what it means to be Krishna conscious. To think, and to think of the person, just like when you think of your lover, do you think of something impersonal? No, it's a personal. You think of, of the person's form, you think of the person's personality, their name. Just like they wrote one song, um, you may, maybe before some of your time, um, there was a song, um, and the person was uh, singing that, uh, I just met a girl named Maria, and suddenly Huh? Suddenly, I found how wonderful a sound can be. Maria, say it softly. It's almost like praying. Say it loudly. It's... Yeah, music playing. Maria, Maria. I'll never stop saying Maria. Maria, Maria, Maria. And goes on and on. Because he has identified the person with the name. And that's the same principle of this chanting, is that the name and the person are the same, absolute, on the transcendental platform. Okay, So chanting is one very easy and pleasurable way to become Krishna conscious. You can do it anywhere, anytime. No rules and regulations. Next question. What happens when you are free from the cycle of life? Do you cease to exist or exist with the divine? What happens? Yes. You don't cease to exist because we're eternal, but we exist exactly with the divine in the spiritual world. So getting free from the cycle of birth and death means getting free from the prison shackles of this material entanglement. It's like if someone's in prison and they get out of prison, doesn't mean they don't exist. They're out of prison and they're out of the death, old age and disease and the continuation of it. It's considered a bondage. Why? Because it's not happiness. You may say, well, I got happiness last week. I went to the, you know, the amusement park. I got a lot of happiness. According to the Vedas, this is not real happiness. This is a kind of ephemeral, pseudo, uh, so-called happiness. It's not real happiness for the soul because it's based on sense gratification. It's, in other words,
Let's say, get a little artistic now. Uh, fish. So when the fish is out of water, let's say somehow or other, he's taken out of the water and put it on the beach, on the sand. So do you think the fish is very happy in that situation? Maybe a nice sunny day. Maybe there's a nice breeze blowing. Maybe even someone brings him something to eat, offers him a little, or maybe he's you know, situated in a comfortable part of the sand. Do you think he'll be happy? No, because it's not his natural habitat. No matter what you do, even if you brought the most beautiful she fish over and introduced him, <laughs> said, Mr. Fish, I'd like to introduce Minnie. Uh, she's a very beautiful fish. She's, she'd like to keep company with you. Still, he won't be happy. He might be a little bit, he might think, well, yeah, she's nice, uh, but still, he can't really be happy because he is out of his natural environment. When he's put back in the water, then he can be satisfied. All those things can satisfy him. So in the same way, as long as we're in samsara, we are like fish out of water, on the sand, and no matter what we do, we won't be fully satisfied until we're back in the, into the transcendental ocean of spiritual bliss. Okay. Next question. The website mentioned vegetarianism, but I found little information on how this applies to your faith. Could you explain why you choose to be vegetarians? And if someone wanted to join your faith, can they maintain their own eating habits, or is this practice a required part of the religion? Are there any animal products allowed, such as cheese and milk? Yes. We are vegetarians, um, or be, because primarily the Vedas say that before we eat, we should offer the food to Krishna in a type of meditation ceremony or a meditation offering. So because Krishna happens to be vegetarian, then we also become vegetarians. He doesn't eat meat, he doesn't accept it meat, fish, or eggs. Someone I noticed asked uh, about uh, the eggs. The idea is we don't eat uh, animals or fish or eggs um, because Krishna doesn't accept them. That's the primary reason. Aside from that, there's a principle of nonviolence, as mentioned, although nonviolence, it may apply to uh, certain situations. In, in the case of animals, there's there's no need to eat them. Now, if there were a situation where there was nothing else to eat, then perhaps one might uh, have to eat. There, there may be, sometimes they say about Jesus that he ate fish. Maybe in the desert there may not have been anything else to eat, perhaps in such an ex a situation, one. But when it's not necessary, then man is recommended to, to eat uh, vegetarian foods and offer them to Krishna first. How does it apply? Well, um, it applies because we all eat every day, and the food that we eat affects our consciousness. Everything that we do affects our consciousness. So if we eat uh, food that has been offered to Krishna, that's called prasadam. Can you say that? Prasadam? Prasadam is, means mercy, and we didn't bring any this time, and I apologize. I thought we were going to get a big bunch of Yeah, we have, on occasion, we brought a big uh, meal and feast and everything, and I apologize we weren't able to do that. But you are cordially invited to visit us on Sunday. You have the card, 4 o'clock, and we'll make it up to you. Yeah. Okay. Hmm? Oh yeah, 10 course vegetarian feast, and there's no charge, so that's our offering. Um, 
We, we're called lacto-vegetarians, technically, which means we do take uh, milk products. Um, the cow gives more milk than her calf requires, and that's because the milk is meant for the human species. And milk helps to produce the finer brain tissues required in the brain for understanding spiritual topics. So therefore, it's recommended to take of course, it would be best if all the cows were protected and were not sent to the slaughterhouses. And our own farms, we have many farms throughout the world, our cows are protected uh, for their whole lives and uh, they're never harmed. Now you might say, why is the cow singled out? Uh, the cows, again, the cow's milk is especially suitable for that. It's also used in sacrifices uh, spiritual sacrifices, and the cow is the symbol of religiosity, according to the Vedas. Next question. On your website, one of the four pillars of spiritual life is cleanliness. Could you explain what this means, physical cleanliness or spiritual cleanliness, or both? Yes, both. Um, <coughs> Physical cleanliness, taking bath regularly, keeping the domicile in a clean state. Um, and also inner cleanliness, um, avoiding um, impure thoughts, impure uh, speech, impure actions. This chanting, for example, is specifically meant to purify us internally to purify the consciousness. Cheto darpanam arjunam, bhava maha dvagni nivapanam, shreya kairava, etc. Which means that this chanting is... Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> not that I know. I'm just thinking to give you the proper answer. Um, not so much. Um, I just spent one year in India. I just got back last week. So I uh, was spending most of my time in South India. And there are some sadhus, saintly devotees of Krishna, who will take bath only in rivers, in holy rivers, and things like that. Um, we, of course, in the West, uh, may not be able to follow all the principles, all the ideals, uh, so we may use water. Uh, things like that that are suitable. So, not particularly immersion. Just the main immersion is to be immersed in the in the chanting, as you said, and chanting and hearing about Krishna. That is the real cleanser for the soul. Next question: Why just study the Bhagavad Gita when the Ramayana and the Vedas are equally as we uh, we mentioned the you study all of them. I wouldn't say, you know, the nature of the mind is it's always thinking about these things, isn't it? Our past and it's dreaming about the future and so it's hard to not remember what we did before and especially high points in our so-called past we tend to, you know, our mind tends to filter out the unpleasant ones, at least I don't know about Yours, but mine does. I see. Or do you like to remember the unpleasant parts in the past? Pleasant or unpleasant? Well, all of them. Well, he's a realist. <laughs> what about some of you? Mostly you remember pleasant or unpleasant? Well, most of my uh, memories of my past, I, I remember more a few pleasant moments where I was, you know, in some kind of a pinnacle position, but. Um, as far as missing it, I wouldn't say that I miss it because uh, with this knowledge, transcendental knowledge, gives one a, a good way to assess one's situation. Rather than just judging on the basis of emotions or feelings or like that, judging more on um, 
the actual situation. You know, as I, certainly there are some enjoyable things in material life, but we have to consider what the effect of those enjoyable things are, if you know what I mean. In other words, I was born in a Western environment. I was not born into Krishna consciousness. I took it up when I was 20 years old. So my life before that was quite normal. And that's all I knew. So there wasn't much else I could do. Um, that was the way I was brought up. And, uh, but when I became exposed to Krishna consciousness, then I found it to be a, um, a superior alternative. And I'm not sorry that I've done that. That was 37 years ago. Next question. If we're not individuals, why do we have free will? Oh, good question. But we are individuals. And we do have free will because each individual has his own choice. Some individuals uh, are not interested in spiritual life. Some inter individuals are interested in other things as they choose. And therefore, the karma must also be individual. Free will means that I can decide what I want. Now sometimes the question comes up, well, if, if God is the supreme controller, which he is, and he's all-powerful, which he is, then how is it that we have any ability to make our own choices? Well, yes, he endows that free will on the living entity to decide how he wishes to uh, perform his activities. Why must one de-identify oneself in order to have Krishna consciousness? Not exactly de-identify, but to de-misidentify. Right now we are misidentifying ourselves as being this body, isn't it? If someone asks us, who are you? We say, well, I'm, a, I'm 20 years old, I, I'm, I'm American, I'm male. I'm uh, brown hair. We, we describe the body. We may even give a name. But these things are not really us. That's like if someone says, um, if someone calls up and says, could you describe yourself? He says, yes, I have a brown shirt. I'm wearing a brown shirt and I have uh, sneakers. I have Reeboks and I have uh, white socks. They say, no, no, what about you? Not just your clothes. But in the same way, this body is a set of clothing. We have one set of clothing here, then we have another set. The skin, the hairs, the blood, seven different layers, saptadatu in Ayurveda, as a whole system. These are all coverings. They're not really me. We can do a little experiment. For example, if we point to our uh, hand, right? this is, whose hand is this? my hand, and my knee, this is my knee, my head, my nose, so where are you? And we're saying, my head, my body, but who's, where is the, the person who owns the body? So that's the, per, that's the real soul, that's who we are, we're not this body, this body is a covering, that's all. So, Krishna consciousness means to to de-misidentify oneself with the body and correctly identify oneself as being a spiritual being. Okay, next question. Okay. Is Krishna the same as highest attainable pleasure? Yes. Yeah, that's nice. Krishna, of course, is much more than that. He's a person, but Yes, when one does link with Krishna through yoga, can you say that, yoga? yoga. You all know yoga. But uh, yoga means union, to unite, to link with the Supreme. So a lot of times what's being taught as yoga today is not actually yoga, just to give you a little uh, forewarning. Yoga means to link with the Supreme. It doesn't just mean to do some exercises and, you know, reduce your... You know. 
Uh, that may, there are systems of yoga which can be used to help one elevate the consciousness towards the Supreme. And they are uh, called uh, Ashtanga Yoga, Hatha Yoga, Asana, Pranayama, etc. Okay. Next question. On the website, you speak of science giving a limited picture of reality. Do you believe that science will eventually begin to reach or prove the reality that it cannot yet see? <clears throat> science, as we know it, uses the empirical method. In other words, based on what experimentation we have done with our senses, what knowledge we've gathered through our senses, then we extrapolate and we expand that um, and we try to go beyond. Now, when we go too far, then it becomes mere speculation. For example, if we say that how the creation began so many billions of years ago, now what evidence, what type of, what type of evidence could we have that would give us sufficient you know, provable, verifiable evidence to say what, how things, when, when it was created and how. So that's a, an example of going beyond the, the field of science. So that is not the field of science through the empiric method. Now, if scientists adopted a different process, a deductive process, receiving knowledge from higher authority, then yes, then it could be, uh, it could be, used to achieve or to understand things beyond our capacity at this point. But through the senses, no, it's not possible. These are, these are things that are beyond our perceptions, beyond our material senses and minds can conceive. Therefore, if it's inconceivable, it has to be received from a, a divine method. Then we can understand these things. So well, just a few more questions and then we'll, well. We got time. All right. What, is exa what exactly is the significance of Krishna art in Hare Krishna? Because the eyes uh, like to see beautiful things. Uh, this is, by nature, the soul has senses. This body, although it's not the, it's not the person, it is a covering, and it also has senses, but they're not perfectly spiritual senses. But still, by using the eyes and engaging them in seeing beautiful Krishna art, then the eyes become purified, and thus the consciousness becomes purified. Next. When one is birthed into a body after death, is it also a physical body here on earth, or can we be animals or something else? Yes. We discussed that. It can be any one of the species of life, 8,400,000 species, including animals or plants, or it can be a divine transcendental body, which is even better. That's the, I noticed a lot of you asked about that, uh, stopping the cycle. Yes, when one gets that spiritual body again, then he doesn't have to go through the cycle of birth and death again. He lives eternally in the spiritual world. And here's one. The website talks about illicit sex. Is it saying that sex is okay within marriage or for the sake of having children? Does this mean sex is okay with someone as long as you have the intent to have children with him or her? Uh, yes, to answer the first part of your question, that sex is okay within marriage for the sake of having children. That is our policy in Krishna consciousness. When one is in the grihasta or family uh, ashram, then it is acceptable to have sex for children within marriage. When one is not married, then yes, that is considered illicit sex. Okay. And the last question, and again, I could only take one from each of the papers. Why would we, one of my colleagues said, why don't we answer them all on the website and you know, put it on our website. Maybe, maybe we'll do that, we'll see. Why would we want to free ourselves from the cycle of life? I think we covered that because 
Dukalayam Shashatam, this place is a place of suffering. Nobody likes to get cancer, but cancer comes. No one likes to have their relatives die, but the relatives die. No one likes to have terrorism, but terrorism happens. This is the nature of this material world. So that's why we want to go beyond it. All right. So now, Question. further questions. Yeah. And if you have no questions, that's okay. We can also chant some more, so don't feel too... Yeah. All right. Yes? I was wondering how long, like, what's the longest period of time you've chanted, like, once a, like, for, like, an hour, like, three hours, and then um, Can you hand me my beads? I'll show you. Yeah, my japa beads. There's, we do two basic types of chanting. One is the type you saw just now. And that can go on for hours. Just depends on how enthusiastic you chant. So yes, many, many hours. I lost count after so many hours. And another type of chanting is called japa, on beads, meditation beads. And this is a private type of chanting. That was kind of a group or external with instruments. And and this is just private Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And we do this a certain number of times every day. Initiate, initiated disciples, they do this a certain number of times every day. And that can also, also be done for many hours at a time. Other questions? We have jobs We don't. Because we're, you know, running a college and uh, busy doing all of our coming and educating people. That's, I guess you could say that's a job, education. But there are many who in our, uh, in our congregation, you might say, who are devotees of Krishna, but you would never know it by looking at them. Because they appear to be just like everyone else. Even George Harrison was a, a very devout Hare Krishna devotee. But it wasn't known to everyone. And there's, there are many today. Um, I, it was a funny, one, t one person when I was in Florida a few years ago, uh, was getting, I had some sandals and I was getting my sandals fixed. And the person who was fixing my sandals, he said, you know, what I saw uh, some time back, um, I guess this was just before Johnny, the Tonight Show style. I guess that was quite a while ago. How, how long ago was that? Johnny Carson show? Oh, <laughs> okay. So anyway, just before that stuff, Willie Nelson was on his show. And so Johnny Carson, they told me that this person said that Johnny Carson asked him, so tell me, uh, Willie, what's your, you know, what religion are you? He said, ah, oh, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. He said, no, no, please tell me. He said, okay, Hare Krishna. And Johnny threw up his pencil. So anyway, there are people who are Hare Krishnas that you may not know because they may not, you know, broadcast it. Okay. Other questions? I noticed all three of you have these yellow marks on the bridges of your nose. Does that have any, uh, like, uh, symbolic meaning? Yeah. It uh, marks the body as a temple of God. Um, someone over here? Yes. Um, how did you personally come to this faith, and what made you decide that it was right for you? Well, a friend of mine uh, that I went to uh, school with had joined, and I didn't know it. I hadn't seen him for some time, and uh, I happened to chance upon him while they were out chanting one night. And so I thought, oh, this poor fellow, I have to save him. So I decided to uh, talk with him, and we ended up talking for about two hours, and uh, that was it. I mean, in a, in a nutshell. You know, as I, I accepted the philosophy as being quite... Uh, you know, satisfying. Okay, ask that one first. How did you guys feel? Oh, well, for me, I was, uh, had been through a number of traditions and um, <clears throat> had for some guidance on the next step. And um, I was actually traveling through the middle of the Mojave Desert, right about in the center of it. And uh, Krishna arranged the next step, 
I, uh, there was a devotee hitchhiking. So within a few minutes, he was reading from the Bhagavad Gita, and it was answering every question I had ever had. And uh, it was doing it in such a, a thorough way that it just completely reawakened me spiritually. So that's how I contacted It wasn't expected. So you told me you were a teacher. Before. Yes, I taught college for about 12 years. Uh -huh. It's about from the very childhood, trying to figure it out. I'm from Czech Republic, Eastern Europe, so we have a communist education which is not very God conscious. So, uh, but many people they inquire about some how to. I was wondering why there's so much. Well, okay. It's the group that I was in, we thought that uh, that was the, the, you know, what we're supposed to do. Spiritual life under actually. <laughs> that I was from, um, it was pretty materialistic, okay? Yes, sir. Uh, our textbook said that you guys would normally wear uh, white or orange outfits, similar to what you have on. Why uh, those colors? Why orange is for those who are, have taken vows of celibacy. Um, there are different stages. Some take vows of celibacy for a... Uh, for some period of time, but not necessarily permanent, and some take permanent vows. So there's four different divisions. The white is usually for the householders. None of us are married here, so we don't wear white. But if there were some married people here, the men would wear white, and the ladies wear colorful saris, generally. Other questions? I have one. Uh, does it matter like on what hairstyle you can have? Because it seems like the majority have the ponytail and everything shaved off. But is that some kind of rule you have to do? Or well, now it's become quite popular, isn't it? Many people are shaving their heads. Formerly, <laughs> when I started uh, this, no one. It was very strange. If I, whenever I went, people always, you know, kind of noticed it. But now, I was just in. Uh, where was it? Oh, I was in. As I was coming back from India. We were in uh, some place, and um, there was a young man and woman. The man, they were from America also, and they were coming back on the same plane. And the man had a shaved head. And so uh, when they saw us, the people in the airport and the guards, it was in the Middle East actually, we were going through uh, Bahrain. And so they started, you know, chanting and kind of. And then when they saw him, they started chanting, too. They, they assumed he was one of us, too. So you have to be careful. You know, if you wear a shaved head now, people may start chanting Hare Krishna. But yes, this, this is called a shika, and it's a, like the flag on the top of the temple. The body is a temple of God, and it's like a flag on the top decoration. More or less, yes. I think it's, it's fair to say that, that, that one who's, um, who's an initiated disciple, initiated devotee of Krishna, he will rise early, generally before 4 o'clock in the morning, and uh, he'll try to reduce the sleeping uh, as much as possible, not unreasonably, but uh, minimize it, and uh, a lot of chanting and things like that, yes. Even those who have jobs and things like that, they, they should uh, try to get up early and do their chanting and, and reading before they go to work. And often they do that. There was a question down here. Is there any specific hairstyles that they would wear? Generally, yes. Um, uh, they're advised to you know, wear their hair back and they braid it in the back and they have a, um, a part down the center. They wear long hair, they don't cut it, generally. And do females take vows of celibacy also? They may, yes. And of course, yes, they do. And uh, when they're not married, of course, they're completely celibate. When they're married, also same as the men. Mm -hmm. Do um, women, are they allowed to go out and chant with you? Because I was wondering, 
Have you ever taught? Well, our, our college here in Kansas City is, is a men's seminary, so that's why you don't see so many women. Although there are many women in our congregation, just as many as men, but, and they do sometimes join us for chanting. But if you go to any other city or you know, major center, then you'll find women there too. But we just, at this point, we just have a men's seminary. Kansas City. We're the first, you could say, uh, degree awarding seminary college in our organization. How many people go through college now? Is it growing? It's uh, growing um, in different ways, um, not necessarily always in numbers, but uh, we're working towards accreditation now and our campus has become secured and different, uh, we're working on accreditation now and things like that. So. It's a small, humble beginning. We just began a few years ago. Any last questions? We want to thank you.